Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our conference, Migration, Race, and Development in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and senior fellow at um, the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs here at Brown University. And it's my distinct pleasure to invite you to this two-day conference. I wanted before we begin to give a little background um, into the conference. We were very fortunate last year. And when I said, when I say we, I mean Clarks and Anthony Bogues, who has just joined us, who is a director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and Brian Meeks, the, who was at the time um, the director of Africana Studies Department, Right and Reasons Theater. We were very lucky to receive uh, an Andrew Mellon Foundation Sawyer seminar um, last year, uh, which allows us to do um, quite a range of programming around the theme, rethinking the dynamic interplay of migration, race, and ethnicity in the Caribbean and Latin America. And this event today is the first of two conferences we're planning over this academic year. The second one is in March, on the 17th and 18th of March. In addition, we have a number of exhibitions planned, two of which are happening in March as well, um, coinciding with the conference, as well as a number of workshops. So we have a very um, active years um, worth of activities. We decided to center our programming around two central themes. The first is intra-regional migration. And most of the discourse on migration, especially when it captures the media's um, attention has been on migration from the South to the North, primarily um, from the region to the US and from North Africa into um, Europe. Although that is true in, in, in that the majority of people who move from Latin America or within Latin America move to countries outside of the region, there nevertheless remain significant migrations within the region, as well as um, people are displaced internally in countries. Um, Honduras and El Salvador, for example, have large numbers of internally displaced people. Some countries such as Argentina are key destinations for migrants, while others such as Venezuela and Haiti have seen many of their citizens move to other countries in the region. Uh, as of July this year, just over 4 million people had migrated from Venezuela to neighboring countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Migration has also seen sizable impacts on some countries' composition. Belize, for example, has had its population increase by a whopping 15% in large part because of migration from Guatemala. The region is also increasingly a site for migration flows from outside of the region mainly from Africa, Asia, North America, America, Central America, the Caribbean and Europe, representing 21% of total immigration. But of course, migration is not new in the region. There are rich historical patterns that we can draw on as well um, that allow us to reflect as well on all more contemporary movements. So we wanted to descend to the US border um, in exploring some of the critical issues in migration within our region. Although we can't entirely ignore the border, we thought it important to explore some aspects of movement within and among countries, the various drivers, the experience of migrants as they move within their own countries or as they cross borders within the region. Um, we, this is, and on the research area, apparently the IOM found that the majority of academic output on migration is from the perspective of the, the destination region, in particular the US and Europe, 
with research by academics affiliated with students in that, sorry, with institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean represented only around 2% of migration research. So it's, there's definitely a space for, for the kind of reflection that we're hoping to do. The other element of, this, of our programming is a focus on race, ethnicity, and gender, and how these terms intersect with migration. Or, or the experiences rather, not the terms. But uh, we are interested in exploring questions of how race is implicated in earlier migratory flows, flows sorry, how contemporary attitudes to race in term in turn have changed the narrative and experience of, of those migrants. We're hoping to explore how contemporary migration is influenced by fact, by or occurs in response to racial and ethnic discrimination, how discrimination on these grounds, this conditions migrants experience. And of course, the pandemic provides a unique opportunity for us to explore how migrants respond to such events, how, how they, how these events influence attitudes towards migrations or migrants, sorry, and how governments have responded, the adequacy of that response. And of course, as climate change um, intensifies, we the effects that are, are already being seen and how these effects are likely to intensify are areas that we are very much interested in exploring. So our first conference will focus today and tomorrow, will focus on migration and development, looking at how perceptions of migrants reinforce constructions of narratives around which migrants are considered desirable, undesirable, deserving, undeserving, who benefits and loses from migration, how terms like benefit and loss are even um, conceptualized and understood. And the second conference, we're hoping to focus more on the intersections of migration and violence and the responses of states and how reflecting on historical migratory flows alongside more contemporary movements can help us to understand how migration has shaped and is reshaping the region. Happily, what we hope to happen and what we have on paper and how panelists actually interpret these themes in their own work will lead to a much different, sorry, richer reflection on these issues than we could have possibly imagined. So the first conference brings together a rich mix of activists, community organizers, students, and academics across a range of disciplines to reflect on, on these themes. So I want to thank you so very much to our panelists and moderators for making the conference possible. And I will turn over to Anthony Bogues, who is the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory and Director of the Study for Slavery and Justice to make some comments. And he will be followed by Brian Meeks, Professor of Africana Studies. So, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lewis. I want to add my own words of welcome um, to the various panelists and moderators uh, in attendance at this very first uh, conference that this particular project is hosting. I would also like to uh, underscore the your central role in, um, in this project. It was your idea to make, uh, to apply for the Mellon and the writing of the document and all the necessary bureaucratic and administrative things that make um, that attend to trying to trying to make sure that um, such a you know such a project received funding was really done by you in many ways as you did the, a lot of the heavy lifting so i would like to um, signal my own appreciation on that the conference uh, attendance attendees should be aware of the, the work, um, your work in leading this particular process. So thank you very much. This, um, this particular project is, uh, you know, is a, is a project, collaborative project between CLASS, um, CSSJ, and then Africana Studies, um, to, uh, to Professor Meeks at this at the point in time um, when we did it. And uh, such collaborations, I think, are important. 
uh, institutional and well, but also I think important generally in um, in 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 the in the academy. The my only my final words would be that I think this is an important um, event. Uh, it brings together uh, scholars from uh, the Latin America and Caribbean, and I put all those in quotation marks um, region. And I think that it, uh, the, the focus, which is to try and think about intra-regional migration, um, it, I think is a very important one, as uh, Comrade Lewis, as, as, uh, as uh, Professor Lewis said. Um, there is a um, there is a there's a lacuna in trying to think about um, this particular um, uh, field of study within the academy, and um, hopefully that this particular project will uh, kickstart uh, a set of um, a set of uh, projects and research that would uh, would begin to fill that lacuna. So let me just add my again my own words of thanks. Um, to, to, to all of you for coming to welcome you to, to Brown and to really pay a special thanks and tribute to Professor Lewis for leading this particular uh, process. Welcome to you all. Professor Meeks. Thank you, Tony, Professor Boggs. And uh, I have very little to add except to extend my own welcome. Um, on behalf of Africana Studies, at the time I was chair, I am now just um, a soldier in the department, but nonetheless quite happy to be associated with this um, as a member of Africana Studies, Rights and Reason Theater. I want to just underline that this is uh, Professor Lewis's, Patsy's um, brainchild more than any of us. We are, I, I certainly am very happy to be uh, associated with it, but it was her thinking and more specifically the notion of a conference that would shift the, the geography, the, the, the lens, um, you know, from just gazing at the, at the Mexican border, which is what is often done in the United States, and um, focusing on what is happening um, south and, and intra-south. Um, more particularly. I think this has been a, a, an important um, shift. The frame is everything. And depending on how we look at things, we see all sorts of histories and movements that extend back centuries, really, and um, are, are critical in understanding migration in general, but particularly the present moment. So I, I just want to underline my, my um, my um, congratulations to her and to the, 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 all the people in CLACS. And I, I do have a particular um, ear in which I hear all of the clatter of work going on in CLACS, even though I myself am not there. And I, I do know that this, this goes very deep and that there's been a lot of work over the, over the, the last few weeks. So um, the other thing I want to, to say again is to underline Tony's point about the kind of collaboration that this involves, because it is, it is not immediately obvious that Africana studies, um, the center for the study of slavery and justice and CLAC should be in alliance. But if you look just below the surface, you will see that there are connections there to be made at the level of the history of questions of justice, of, of uh, a history that goes back into the colonial and era and the era of slavery, and that extends into the contemporary period. And of course, the critical involvement of, of the African diaspora in all of these movements, along with other diasporas from uh, Central America and South America, uh, is, is, is central to the whole process. So I just want to say again, um, welcome to all. Um, thank you, Patsy. Thank you, Clax. Um, it's great to be in this collaboration with Clax and the CSSJ, uh, yourself and Tony. Okay, thank you, Brian and Tony, for those over generous comments. Of course, you, your role is far more critical than either of you are giving yourself credit for. Um, but I thank you for the role you have played. And I'm glad that we have time left so I can give proper thanks 
thank yous. I just want to pay for um, don't amount to things happening. And we have been very, very fortunate to have working with us um, a steering committee of uh, faculty at Brown. Um, and I'd like to name them and express my gratitude to them. Jerry Augusto, Leila Lennon, Patricia Figaro, Maya Rivers Gamble, Richard Snyder, Lisa Bakes, Andrea Flores, Kevin Escaduro. We also have been very fortunate, as I mentioned, to have Christine Collins working with us as a postdoc and Alexandra Miller and Karen DeMota, two of our graduate students who have been central players and who built off the work of two graduate students we had working with us over the summer, Lubaba Traudry and Aisha Sanley, both of whom are in the field doing their, um, their field work. We also have working as a central player or center manager at Clarks, Kate Goldman, our director of undergraduate studies, Erica Durante, and we have been joined by an, a student in the Masters in Public Administrations program, Frank Batista Kuhnhardt. So we're very lucky to have a team of very engaged people working with us. We also have to, to thank our advisory committee, um, a, a small advisory committee of Juliet Hooker, Evelyn Hugh de Hart, Pedro Dalbo, Colin Channer, Laura Lopez Sanders, and Nils Safir, who have been very, also given us critical guidance and suggestions. So we, it's not just one person, we have quite a team working on this and um, you would participants, panelists would recognize some of these names in, in the various um, email communications with you. I apologize, I apparently am rustling paper that's making a very loud disturbing noise, but uh, I, I, sorry, I still have more papers to rustle because I have some housekeeping notes before um, we actually start. Audience members can access panels today and tomorrow using the same Zoom link. So the only link that changes is for the Zoom party tonight. Um, you, those of you who are on YouTube live stream, you can shift to register um, via Zoom so that you can actually raise questions if, if you so choose. So just to know that there's that option. Um, we we'll continue to share the link. The, no, sorry. I'm asking if you guys would continue to share the registration links to your colleagues. So um, these are open. The link is active until the last session tomorrow. So please feel free to continue sharing those. Um, now, we are asking our moderators, we have a special favor to ask of you. We're asking you to please keep time. We are relying on you. It's more difficult with a Zoom conference to manage everything than if we're all together in a room. So we're really asking you to keep within the scheduled time. We have a bit of flexibility built in, but you know we really don't want um, panels to go over into other panels. If that happens, we will interrupt you. Um, but please don't rely on us to do it. We don't want to do it. So we're, we really are hoping that you would help us to manage, to manage this as well. Participants can use the chat and Q&A um, buttons to ask questions. Those of you who are in the room can add, also raise your hands. So it's nice to have that kind of interaction so you can actually um, ask your questions, not just in the Q&A function. So please feel free um, to, to do that uh, when you can. Okay, this is beyond me because I don't have Twitter, but those of you who are interested in, in tweeting, you can tweet hashtag, is that? what it is, migration at Brown. 
Hashtag migration and burns. Okay, I need to say this more confidently. Okay. <laughs> and um, translation is available for panels that have, um, we have Spanish English um, interpretation for some panels, for the bilingual panels. And you, of course, you can find the icon that will allow you to choose the language channel and you can toggle between them um, as you wish. All panels will automatically generate closed captioning. So if you want, you can look under the live transcript as well. Um, okay, great. Kate has just put a note that makes sense of hashtag migrate migration at Brown so that you can people with Twitter can see that. Um, is there anything else I need? Okay, I think um I think that's mostly it. Um, Kate, is there anything else that we need to remind? No, I think we're doing great. I would just invite everyone to come to our live music event this evening at 7 p.m. And if you need information about that, you can find it on our website, which is watson.brown.edu forward slash clacks. And since we have a few minutes, I would just like to invite you to look at our website for all, if you're interested in you know, what we're doing, what we're about, we have um, archived talks that you know, are available on our website. We have upcoming events. Um, next week, we have two events that you know, we, if you would like to, um, you can regist register via our website. Um, one is by Dixa Ramirez, one of our um, affiliated faculty. And Dixa's talk is on Monday at noon, um, entitled Indolence, Insolence and Blackness in the Hills. And Dixa is an associate professor of American studies and English here at Brown. And her work focuses very much on the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And that's on Monday, the 8th at noon. On Thursday, we have Lucilla, Lucilla Neyankis, who is our COGOD visiting professor. And um, Lucilla is from Argentina. And her talk will be socio environmental strategies for strengthening the resilience of women migrant workers in the Reconquista area of Buenos Aires. And that's this Thursday, again at noon. And all of these are on our, on our website. Um, we also have our, the call for papers of our March conference also on our website and those expressions of interest are open until the end of December. So again, there's a lot of information on our, on our website. Two of our, I had mentioned that we, we plan, we're working on two exhibitions at you know, that will be available at the March conference. By the way, the March conference, we're expecting it to be a mix, it to be hybrid, you know, a mixture of Zoom and, and, and people being here. Um, fingers crossed, who knows what spring would look like, but you know, that's what we're working with. And the two exhibitions, are, one is centered on art that has been created by, um, by artists, amateur artists um, in ICE detention centers, um, reflecting their experiences. And it's described as defying the institutional pressure to hide, isolate, or detach from community while in detention. The featured artists demonstrate that they actively build support networks, visions for their futures, and shared strength. 
The exhibition will display a dialogue among immigrants, emphasize agency despite restrictive conditions and spur conversation about the ways that those of us who wish to become accomplices for a change may amplify calls for justice. And the second um, exhibition is called Walking Through the Sazon of Rhode Island, Migration and Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship. This is a working title. And this is an exhibition that tells the story of immigrant entrepreneurs in the food industry near Brown University, featuring oral histories, photos, and objects that represent a selection of Latinx owned and Caribbean owned restaurants, bodegas, and supermarkets. And the exhibition highlights the ways that our local community is shaped by migration. And Kate, do you want to say something about, or Christian, about the, the people we're having for our dance music this evening, our music event, the fun part of, of thinking about migration? Unmute my microphone. Okay. Um, okay, you're muted now. My computer froze. Okay, you seem to be okay now. Yeah. Okay. I can't. Okay, okay, but we, we come back to that later on. Welcome to those of you just joining us. Um, sorry. Okay, Brian, would you like to set up your panel? Now, I'm just asking everyone if you can mute yourselves if you, you're not on this particular panel um, and you can choose to either stay on I screen. I can't log out because if I do, I'm hold. We're hearing you, Keith. Okay, um, thank you, Patsy. And um, this is the first panel. Uh, which should begin at 9.30, which is in a minute or two. So we can probably get ourselves together. I hope Let me just try and close a bunch of stuff and then. Hello. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so um, uh, let's try to get ourselves together. Um, Alyssa Trotz, Anna Paulina Lee, um, Monica DeHart and Percy Hinson. Are we, can we all sort of identify ourselves that we're here? I'm not, I don't have, um, I don't have a, a view that shows me, okay, Monica, I'm seeing you now. Alyssa, I'm seeing you, Anna Paulina. And Percy who was here earlier on, but seems to have done a runner. No, there's Percy. Um, okay, great, wonderful. Um, okay, so um, this is how we're gonna do this panel, which will start in a minute or two. This is the time when we're all sitting down at the desk just immediately before that panel, live panel starts. Um, I'm gonna actually introduce you before you speak, as opposed to all four in the beginning which will give us a little more time, I imagine, to settle ourselves in this, in this format. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna follow the order of the program, which is Alyssa first, um, followed by Anna Paulina Lee, followed by Monica, and then Percy Hinson, okay? So we, I've, I've been told you have a maximum of 15 minutes, and um, I, I have my stopwatch here. So I'm gonna to try to work with that because I think we're working with a very tight agenda. And um, 
I, I give up verbal signal at, at 13 minutes, maybe two minutes before you end. Um, so I won't interrupt you a lot, but I'll try to work with 13 minutes and just say two minutes or something and, 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 and get back out of your space. And then at 15 minutes, I'll come back again because we really have to try to keep within our, our time. Okay, so welcome um, to the panel, Colonial Legacies and Movement. Who is part of the nation? And to our panelists, um, and I'll introduce you by name first and then individually before you speak. Alyssa Trotz, um, Anna Paulina Lee, Monica DeHart, and Percy Hinson. Our first speaker is Alyssa Trotz, who is going to be speaking on territoriality, mobility, embodiment, reflections on Shanique Mary versus Barbados. And um, Alyssa Trotz is professor of Car Caribbean studies at New College and director of women and gender studies at the University of Toronto. She's also affiliate faculty at the Dame Nita Barrow Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. Her research is situated within a tradition of feminist political economy and a Caribbean feminist tradition in particular that takes social reproduction as a starting point and node of interrogation to think through histories and processes of dispossession and their contemporary manifestations. Her current work examines entanglements of diaspora, indigeneity, and extra extractivism, excuse me, Alyssa, in colonial Guyana. Alyssa's editor of the anthology, The Point is to Change the World, selected writings by Andaye. And for the last 13 years, she has edited In the Diaspora, a weekly newspaper column in the Guyanese daily, Starbrook News. Alyssa, over to you. Thank you so much, Brian. And um, thank you everyone for showing up early this morning. I'm a little discombobulated because I keep forgetting to, you have to do, go through all these checks to come onto campus. And then I spend 20 minutes trying to find some coffee. So um, just a little flustered. I'm gonna put on my timer and speak fast to make sure that I don't take up more time than I'm allotted. In a public lecture in what was then British Guyana in 1958, CLR James described how he saw federation as, quote, the means and the only means whereby the West Indies and British Guyana can accomplish the transition from colonialism to national independence, can create the birth of a new nation, and by reorganizing the economic system and the national life can give us our place in the modern community of nations, end quote. In his remarks, James recognized the anxieties that could be produced by freedom of movement as part of a single economic space, but concluded that no such problem can be an obstacle to federation. That same year, in an article in the West Indian Gazette in London supporting federation, Claudia Jones would similarly urge, quote, dominion status in five years, an end to all restrictive practices towards minorities, an extension of civil and cultural rights, and freedom of movement between the islands, end quote. It would take another 30 years, and the Grand Anse Declaration of 1989, for the Caribbean community, the version of regional integration that would follow the failed federation and its immediate successor, Carifta, to begin to move towards freedom of movement, but in a context significantly different from the one that shaped James's vision, in which regionalism and a radical internationalism was envisioned as the only route to Caribbean independence. Today, I want to offer some brief thoughts on the retreat from James's vision, in which federation means national independence, quote, or it will mean nothing end quote, and to do this by reflecting briefly on the successful case brought before the Caribbean Court of Justice by Shanique Myrie. 22 years old at the time, Shanique Myrie was a Jamaican national who arrived in Barbados on March 14, 2011. She was taken to a secure immigration area where after questioning, a supervisor gave her an entry stamp for 30 days. Despite this, two police officers removed Myrie to a part of the area reserved for the Royal Barbados Police Force where they subjected her to a vaginal cavity search under threat of imprisonment if she refused. Along with another Jamaican woman similarly detained, Myrie had her luggage searched, nothing was found, her entry stamp revoked for lying about who would be meeting her and where she would be staying, was detained overnight in a filthy cell, 
and along with the other young woman was deported the next day. At no time was she ever permitted to speak with her family or anyone from the Jamaican embassy in Barbados. Myrie filed an action against the state of Barbados under the original jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. In 2013, although her claim that she was discriminated against on the basis of her nationality was rejected, the CCJ upheld Myrie's right and the right of CARICOM nationals to enter CARICOM member states hassle-free under the revised Treaty of Chaguaramas, awarding her damages against the government of Barbados for the denial of, quote, her right to travel within the community without harassment or the imposition of impediments, end quote. There's lots that can be said about this case, but in my brief time today, I want to just sketch a few points. And let me begin by emphasizing movement as constitutive of Caribbeanness, as so many have noted, from Elizabeth Thomas Hope's description of migration as the, as the defining feature of the region and of Caribbean sensibilities, to Charles Carnegie's discussion of itinerant travelers and of a cultural predisposition toward imagining community in global terms, to Michel Rolf Trio's pithy observation that we need to apprehend the Caribbean, not in terms of movement between roles or types, but rather as types or flows that imply movement. The region then is an effective, vibrant space, animated by practices that transgress national boundaries, as Lara Putnam's exploration of borderlands or Shalini Puri's focus on marginal, by which she means intra-regional and not Euro or Western-centric migrations, demonstrate. At a talk given in California, the late Guyanese social activist Andaye put it this way, quote, while ordinary people are far ahead of the governments in re-federating the Caribbean, we once had a federation, you know, it's the governments who broke it up. Maybe this time we can build it from the bottom up. The governments are making something that they call a single economic space, which amounts to one brick every 10 years. And meanwhile, the people are galloping ahead and making their single economic space. Among them are domestic workers, nurses, teachers, traders, or higglers, end quote. Drawing on the experiences of Guyanese women traders during the years of economic scarcity in the 1970s, and I went on to make two further observations, quote, you notice many things, the level of collaboration faced with the hostility of customs and immigration officials across the region, the women worked out very quickly that they could not survive except they dropped race and dropped nation. The other thing about the migration is that it is also moving outside the parameters of the old federation. So these women are not just going to the old English speaking Caribbean and so on, but to the Dutch Caribbean, the French Caribbean, they're all over the place. And now they're also going to South America. So they're actually creating con connections where at other levels, no connections exist, end quote. It is this mobility which CLR James and Claudia Jones sought to give institutional expression to. In other words, there was nothing exceptional or out of the ordinary in Shanique Myrie's decision to travel from Jamaica to Barbados. Rather, it is the decision to challenge and expel Myrie and others like her, a point I will return to, that needs to be denaturalized and resituated as the exercise of territorial jurisdiction by vulnerable Caribbean microstates in the context of economic crisis in the region today. As Lisa Lowe has noted, quote, even as global conditions disaggregate state sovereignty, the state continues to flex its muscles to exert a role in border and immigration policies, end quote. So Shanique Myrie's case foregrounded the clear tension between national sovereignty and regional community law, represented in the Barbadian government's argument that it and it alone reserved the right to determine who could enter the country despite having apparently reached agreement on freedom of movement in 2007 at the 20th meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government, and notwithstanding a reservation entered by Antigua and Barbuda. Its arguments were rejected by the CCJ, which found the 2007 agreement to be legally binding on all member states and ruled that community law could not simply be put aside because a CARICOM country had failed to incorporate a regional decision taken at heads of government into its domestic law. Thus, the CCJ found that CARICOM nationals are allowed entry into another CARICOM country, as well as automatic stay of six months, unless they are proven to be a drain on the public purse or are deemed undesirable. And I should point out that actually it's very strict criteria that exist for these exceptions to be applied. And anyone denied entry, says the CCJ, is to be advised of their rights and provided access to legal representation, none of which Shanique Mary was, was afforded. Crucially, 
the case through interrelief, deeply differentiated experiences of mobility. For whom is the border experienced as a bench, a term that came out of Guyanese experiences at the Grantley Adams Airport in Barbados of being regularly singled out, detained and harassed, including um, a, a former first lady of, of Guyana who was um, not recognized when she arrived at the airport, or a prison as in the case of Shanique Myrie. These discrepancies were partly recognized by several commentaries that applauded the decision as not only a rare attempt to address what is widely referred to as the implementation deficit with respect to the regional integration movement, but crucially of siding with ordinary Caribbean people and as offering a rare instance of institutions protecting the Caribbean people from the violence of nation state sovereignty. At the same time, I would argue that both the ruling of the CCJ and much of the mainstream media response elided the specific kinds of gendered injustices that Shanique Myrie faced. And here I just want to make a few observations. Firstly, the significance of women's travels, particularly those that involve work within the informal sector that make the region a single economic space, as Andaya puts it, those travels continue to remain largely invisible at the level of policy and institutions, as, as exemplified in an op-ed published by um, Ron Sanders in the wake of the Myrie scandal. And I just quote from his op-ed, quote, Despite the fact that business people and other professionals traverse the region every day to transact business, CARICOM governments have not devised a way for them to apply for a stamp in their passports that would establish their bona fides and allow them access to a special line at airports, such as the ones reserved for diplomats and airline staff. Yet these business people are the very ones who keep alive CARICOM trade in goods and services and investment, end quote. This kind of deeply elitist and masculinist perspective erases studies that found, for instance, and I think this was an ECLAC study, that well over 75% of interterritorial agricultural trade was carried out by small traders, most of whom are women. Or that in areas like construction, many Caribbean economies continue to rely heavily on informalized male, male workers, workforces sorry, from across the region. In fact, initial regional efforts to enable CARICOM nationals to move and work across its member countries privileged skill community nationals. The first category of workers to be recognized were university graduates, media professionals, and cultural workers, and originally, in fact, excluded feminized domains like teachers, nurses, domestic and hospitality workers, as well as higgers. It would not be until December 2009, for instance, that CARICOM heads of government moved to extend the free movement of persons under the SME to the Caribbean single market and economy to domestic workers with the requisite national or Caribbean vocational qualifications. And these are just some um, documents that were prepared by the CPDC, the Caribbean Policy Development um, um, uh, a group and uh, a grassroots group of domestic workers from Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, Guyana, and I think Antigua, the Caribbean Domestic Workers Network, which sought to popularize understandings of the freedom of movement provisions under which um, domestic workers could travel across the region as well as others. But there are various barriers that continue to stand in the way of acquiring these qualifications, which have meant that most interregional movement of domestics continues to be undocumented. In the discourse about outsiders, state borders are rendered both given and potentially penetrable, with the nation state recast as porous, vulnerable, and as requiring a robust and fortified response. But, and here I am paraphrasing M. Jackie Alexander, not just anybody can be a CARICOM citizen going about their everyday business with a right to enter another CARICOM country and remain for up to six months. As you can see on this slide, as Shanique Myrie's testimony about the physical and verbal abuse she was subjected to by immigration and police authorities um, forcefully underscored, gender, race, class, sexuality, and nation delineate who is understood as an interloper, whose body gets marked, hauled out of line, deemed as threatening to the body politic and to the reproduction of the nation's borders and future. Nor is this an isolated interloper. Sorry, my PowerPoint's not working well. Rather, it forms part of a wider discourse of women's transgressive sexuality, as we can see in the lyrics of this Barbadian calypso, in which the crisis of the nation turned on a competition between differently nationalized women for the attention of men. 
We see that across the region, not just in Barbados, as in contemporary discourses, for instance, about Venezuelan women in Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. And it is a discourse with particularly virulent effects. It is deeply instructive that in its judgment, the CCJ failed to recognize the compounding relations that rendered a working class woman vulnerable to what amounts to sexual assault and humiliation at the border. Annie Paul has offered an insightful analysis of the ways in which the Jamaican media, in their descriptions of Shanique Myrie's physical appearance at the hearings, sought to counter dominant perceptions of Jamaicans who, quote, regularly transgress the zealously guarded borders of civility and decorum as much as the borders of nation states, which under the new Shagoramas Treaty, they now have a right to breach, end quote. Such portrayals by recapitulating deeply colonial notions of gendered respectability in the effort to cultivate a sympathetic affect in relation to Mairi, produce the line between deserving and undeserving travelers. This is the kind of discourse that has little to no place, for example, for the Caribbean Sex Workers Coalition Montego Bay Declaration issued in 2013, the very same year as the CCJ ruling, and which among other things called for the respect of sex workers' rights to freedom of movement and migration. The final point I want to make about the rank unevenness is about the complete lack of freedom of movement for Haitians in the region, despite the fact that Haiti is a full member of CARICOM. The removal of visa restrictions for Haitians by a few CARICOM countries turned out to be short-lived. Most recently in Guyana this year, following the imprisonment of Haitians who had arrived and had actually been granted entry under the freedom of movement provisions. They were picked up at their hotels and detained as potential victims of human smuggling and trafficking across the Guyana-Brazil border. At the same time, the Shanique Mairi case should caution us against the similar contrast between those who benefit from the freedom of movement provisions and those Haitians across the Caribbean, Venezuelans in Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago who are excluded from its terms. In fact, one month after the CCJ decision, reports surfaced in the newspapers of 13 Jamaicans detained at Piarco International Airport in Trinidad and Tobago and summarily sent back. The border serves to materialize differentiations of gender, race, class, sexuality, nation, and underscores the weakness of enforceability of CCJ decisions meant to be binding on member states. And two sentences, Brian. This is heightened under conditions of economic crisis when outsiders among us, and by us I mean the presumed CARICOM family, are scapegoated for taking jobs and draining public resources. In contrast to CLR James and Claudia Jones's conviction that federation was the best guarantee of life and livelihoods for Caribbean people, or a generation late to Norman Gervin's argument that regional governance is our survival imperative, what the case of Shanique Mairi revealed is competing notions of sovereignty amidst differentiated movements that continue to be thwarted by nationalized immigration regimes and practice of, practices of expulsion, practices whose target is the very communities that stitch the region together in the midst of contemporary and entrenched patterns of violence and exclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, you almost made it. You didn't do badly at all. Thank you. Um, uh, our next panelist is Anna Paulina Lee, who is going to be talking on the aesthetics of Chinese exclusion in the Americas. Anna Paulina Lee is assistant professor of Latin American and Iberian cultures. Lee's research and teaching interests focus on race, gender, nation, and citizenship, slavery and abolition, post-colonial studies, subaltern studies, literary theory, visual culture and performance, and cultural studies with a focus on 19th and 20th century Brazil and Portuguese speaking Asian countries. Professor Lee is the author of Mandarin Brazil, Race, Representation and Memory. Winner of the 2019 Antonio Candido Prize for Best Book in the Humanities awarded by the Brazil section of LASA. Mandarin Brazil examines the way that Brazilian cultural institutes constructed ideas about China and the Chinese to strengthen nationalism and racial whitening ideologies. Lee co-directs the working group Geographies of Injustice, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Social Difference, the Center for Spatial Research, and the Social Sciences Research Council. The Social Action Centered Working Group converges at the intersection of research, activism, memory, and artistic practices to fortify civil liberties concerning self-housing settlements in Rio de Janeiro 
and Bombay Mumbai. Anna Pauline Lee, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Professor Meeks. And so good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank Patsy Lewis and Clax and everyone at the Mellon Sawyer Seminar, all the organizers for bringing us all together across so much distance and time to be part of this really incredible event. So thank you. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the uh, this the question of migration, race, and development in Latin America, and I'd like to bring in a closer perspective of the centuries-long connections between China and Brazil. The global circulation of goods, people, natural resources, and ideas between Brazil and China, or Brazil and Asia, and Latin America and Asia began in the early 16th century when Portuguese explorers in competition with other European empires to find the quickest oceanic routes to the silk and spice trade connected a global network that linked port cities in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. And so here you have a slide and map from 1550 where you can see the Americas in very close proximity to Asia. Here's Cathay, a, that used to be a way of referring to China. Here's um, Zipangri, which was a way of referring to Japan that um, all appear in Marco Polo's writings. And so this map shows Hispania and the Orient, right? As really incredibly close together in the early modern global globalization imaginary. In Brazil, the gradual end of African slavery led many intellectuals, politicians, and agriculturalists to look for China for possibilities of setting up new trade networks and, and Chinese contract labor as a possible substitution for slave labor. These economic concerns were entangled with visions of political modernity in Brazil and debates about how the colonial empire could enter the world stage as a modern Republican state. And so I became very interested in the ways that there were a lot of xenophobic ideas in abolitionist discourses during this time. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna discuss specifically the aesthetics of Chinese exclusion um, as a means to show how racial stereotypes gain historical value when examined within dynamics of global capitalism, migration and strategies of accumulation and dispossession. And so um, I just wanna go back to something that Professor Meek said earlier, which is that it's all about the frame, right? So when we shift the frame, we can see so many interesting contradictions and in histories. And so here, um, my frame is to examine the literary and visual cultures of Chinese exclusion as a really central aspect of social formation of race, nationalism and modernity in Brazil and in the Americas. I turn to Brazil's period of gradual emancipation and debates during this time among Brazilian politicians, military officials, artists, and literati who all engaged with the so-called Chinese question in various ways. And so here in anticipation of the inevitability of Brazilian abolition, which occurred in 1888, the Brazilian Navy in 1879 circumnavigated the world and they sent the first Brazilian mission to China with the intent to open immigration labor networks between China and Brazil as a larger plan, as part of a larger plan to turn to Chinese debt labor to do the work once done by enslaved Africans uh, or the descendants of enslaved Africans. In China, Qing politicians and diplomats were also preoccupied with how to create a new China that could thrive in the Americas. And in their diplomatic correspondences, they referred to Japan as an example of a very successful settler colonial project that China could imitate but develop into its own ways. And here you have a map made by the Qing diplomat Fu Yinglong, who had visited Brazil in the late 19th century. And he wrote about his vision for a model of Chinese settler colonialism. For this talk, I want to focus more on the work of situating Chinese racialization within a larger dynamic of global capitalism and migration to explore the circulation of racial stereotypes in producing socio-legal 
categories of immigrant restriction. And so before I change the slide, I just want to point out this map is really an interesting topography, very much in line with the scientific studies and expeditions of co for colonial projects during the 19th century. And here you have, um, you know, plans of different kinds of agriculture that are possible, the mountainscape, the routes. So it's a, it's a really wonderful map that shows a, a lot about Chinese visions for, re, for sending Chinese migrants to the Americas as well. The 19th century turned to so-called coolie labor coincided with Britain's victory in the first and second opium wars, which forced China into a series of unequal treaties that opened its ports to foreign trade, migration, and legal and territorial concessions to Britain and other imperialist powers. British victories in the South China Seas prompted Portugal to strengthen its existing hold on Macau as a means to declare sovereignty over Chinese dominance and protect its Chinese interests from other European empires. Portugal and China signed the Friendship and Trade Treaty in 1887 to establish sovereignty over Macau. In 1849, Portugal renovated the ruins of the 1573 Ming border wall and constructed the barrier gate to administer trade between the Qing and the Portuguese. The ruins of the 19th century gate still stand in front of the modern border between the People's Republic of China and Macau. And I, I really like this image. Yes. Your, your slides aren't advancing. We just wanted to notify you that oh, uh, you're still in really? the first frame here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so here's the the map of the. Uh, am I? Can you see my maps now? Okay, so here is the map of the Americas and Asia right there. Here's the Zipangri and Cathay is up here, and this next map is the route that the Brazilian Navy took around the world. And here is the map of China that was drawn by Fu Yinglong during his expeditions to Brazil and the Americas. And here is the border wall from the 19th century that replaced the Ming century wall. And it stands in front of the very contemporary border crossing between mainland China and Macau. And so, okay, I think now we are back into order. So the unequal treaties paired with economic and political crisis in China, including internal wars like the Taiping Rebellion that, men led, that led many Chinese men to seek economic opportunities abroad. The illicit trade in opium went hand in hand with the coolie trade. And so by the end of the 19th century, Macau had become the center of the coolie trade, supplying the global demand for exploitable labor. I'm gonna try to, okay for exploitable labor. Can you tell me if you can see the slides now? We can see them, they didn't advance though. Oh, but what about now, do you see the gate? The gate. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so the by the end of the 19th century, Macau had become the center of the coolie trade, supplying the global demand for exploitable labor during the period of gradual emancipation from slavery. If during the first century of the first half of the 19th century, the ports of Salvador and Rio de Janeiro made Brazil the center of the African slave trade. Then Portugal's role in Macau, the center of the coolie trade during the second half of the 19th century, made it clear that the Portuguese empire was committed to maintaining diverse forms of forced migration and coerced labor. The contingent histories of African slavery and Chinese debt labor make clear a migrant labor caste system that was a founding feature of the global capitalist order. In July 1870, the Brazilian government established the Sociedade Importadora de Trabalhadores Asiáticos to implement a plan for long-term Chinese labor in agricultural sectors. The global Chinese question, as it was called, was closely linked to the social formation of race that developed with slavery's racial regimes and accompanying legal structures that produced the Brazilian colonial caste hierarchy. But it shows how ideas about race took on new shape in the formation of racialized national categories and within paradoxes of liberal ideals of freedom. Historian Sidney Chalobu 
argues against the concept the 19th century was a time of transition from slavery to freedom. Instead, he shows that contract labor became synonymous with, quote, coerced labor with workers having to submit to debt bondage and various forms of criminal sanction for breach of contract, unquote. Shalyobi shows that gradual emancipation laws like the 1871 free womb law and the 1885 law that liberated sexagenarians created numerous social and legal ambiguities between slavery and freedom, making the condition of freedom precarious. So while Brazil did not pass stringent Chinese exclusion acts like those in the United States and Canada, Brazilian abolitionists took up their pens in myriad forms of literary and visual production to do the cultural work of stopping Chinese immigration, which they viewed as a direct effort of the Brazilian monarchy's project to maintain Brazil as an enslaved labor colony. And so here's an image from the Revista Ilustrada, and it was published in 1888, and it shows the the liberation of slavery, the abolition of slavery. And then directly after that, the, the person in the middle is the Baron of Cotegipi. And he's, you, you know, can see that he's um, putting handcuffs onto this very submissive looking caricature of Chinese oh, immigrants. No, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. So he's uh, putting the handcuffs on this uh, Chinese worker who is willingly giving over his hands. So he's very, you know, complacent in that. And so being the second that image on it, Belinda, sorry. You, you, you can't, really, you can't see it, okay. It didn't advance. Um, okay. How about that? No, it's still the gate. Okay, let's try. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, great. Okay, so, great, so you can see that, okay. Um, okay, so, well, um, Okay, so fin de sec print media played a critical role in producing an imagined political economy. Um, uh, in an imagined political community against Chinese immigration by conditioning Brazilian national consciousness against the image of the Chinese other. Journalists and authors like João do Rio, the most canonical names of the Brazilian literary um, you know, canon, Machado de Assis, Arthur Azevedo, among others, they deployed tropes about the Chinese as opium addicts and unskilled semi-enslaved laborers in order to stave off what they viewed as a kind of slavery, a new kind of slavery that would inhibit Brazil's transition to a modern nation state with a mighty investment in whiteness and Catholicism. The unequal treaties paired with economic, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and so, Joan du Rio, a journalist wrote about the, about the Chinese in a number of his works. In a piece titled Visions of Opium, he describes an opium den scene and in a neighborhood in Rio where he depicts the Chinese as opiating pigs. And his use of the word pig likely, likely refers to the sale of pigs, a phrase that became interchangeable with clandestine and deceptive systems of Chinese immigration. And so um, can you see my slide here, this newspaper article? Yes. Okay, great. So that's from the New York Times and it just shows that this term was common. So when he said, um, uh, he, he created these, you know, images of opium dens in, in Rio. So carioca opium dens that really re repeated the tropes of opium dens that were circulating in the 19th century in New York City and, and San Francisco. So it was very much a, a very uh, formulaic trope that was also in Brazil. In 1883, one year after the United States passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, Cantonese Comprador, known in Portuguese as Tong King Singh, visited Brazil with the intention to assess Brazil's suitability to receive large-scale Chinese immigration. And here, again, in the Hibis Ilustrada is an image of the Mandarin Tong King Singh. Tong was the managing director of the China Merchant Steamship Company. And here you see him depicted as a Mandarin official standing amidst ghastly caricatures yeah, of yeah, Chinese laborers. Do you see that? Okay. Yes, yes. You, you have oh, I have two minutes. minutes. Okay, great. I'm almost, yeah, I, I'm, I'm great. Thank you. 
So he was looking to Brazil as a possible substitute for opium. He looked at Brazilian coffee. He attempted to negotiate pay rates for the Chinese. And then he quickly learned that coffee industrialists had intended to pursue a debt peonage system. And so he called off negotiations. And throughout the late 19th century, Qing diplomats like Tong King Singh and or compradors like Tong King Singh visited Brazil with similar goals of expanding trade, developing agriculture, and establishing Chinese settlements. These negotiations did not always end in failures. Throughout the 20th century, a small but steady wave of Chinese immigrants continued to arrive in Brazil. Following Tong's visit to Rio, Machado de Assis, under various pseudonyms, wrote a number of parodic pieces regarding his visit to express negative attitudes about Chinese immigration. And so here I have an excerpt from one of his uh, newspaper articles. And here Mashadu is making fun of the, the, man, the Mandarin's accent. And he's using a number of nonsensical words. In addition to being a prolific author and often known as the, you know, the really the beginning of modern Brazilian literature, Machado de Assis was head of the Ministry of Agriculture, where he monitored the implementation of cases regarding the free womb law. He defended the freedom of slaves and freed people over slaveholders' claims of indemnity. However, his writings about Chinese immigration were often tinged with xenophobic rhetoric, and he showed that the project of abolition contained numerous internal contradictions to liberal ideas of freedom. In face of emergent nationalisms and the consolidation of uh, racialized national categories. Okay, Tong uh, Paulino, you have to begin to wind down now. Okay, I'll just, um, so I just wanna show that these recurring jokes and tropes portrayed the Chinese as a race and produced ideas about Chinese gender, sexuality, and labor as unsuitable to heteronormative categories. And so the localized and transnational dimensions of Chinese racialization make clear historical moment that are possible to uncover when we examine, when we situate how racial caricatures, their production and circulation are gain meaning within larger contexts of global capitalism, migration, and economies of accumulation and dispossession. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I, I did give you a couple more minutes there because of the, um, the breakdown. So um, we, have some little flex room. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next um, panelist is Monica DeHart, and she'll be uh, speaking on mapping new routes to development, Chinese mobilities and networks in Central America. So I think there's some continuity definitely here. And Monica DeHart is a distinguished professor of anthropology at the University of Puget Sound, where she's also affiliated with the Latin American Studies and the Global Development Studies programs. Her work focuses broadly on the cultural politics of economic development in Central America, where she's been conducting ethnographic research over 25 years. Her current book, Trans-Pacific Trans Developments, Politics of Multiple Chinas in Central America, builds on ethnographic research in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Guatemala to analyze the different forms and meanings China has taken in the region's development politics. Her previous book, Ethnic Entrepreneurs, explored the ambivalent intersection of neoliberal politics and translocal ethno-development initiatives. Her we recent work has been published in the Journal of Latin American and Caribbean Anthropology, Journal of Chinese Overseas, Third World Quarterly, City and Society and Journal of Latin American Geography, among others. Monica DeHart, over to you. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Professor Meeks, and to all of you. Um, great to be joining you from the still dark uh, West Coast this morning. Uh, we're bright and early, so I appreciate you uh, being lenient with my morning eyes, uh, but great to be with you all this morning. Um, I wanted to begin by following actually very nicely on Ana Paulina's talk uh, to, to move to the present uh, and to indicate the fact that uh, multiple Chinas and forms of Chinese-ness have played a central role in Central American regional development. Uh, as Professor Meeks mentioned in my book, Trans-Pacific Developments, um, I trace the contours of these multiple Chinas, including um, the kind of indentured and free migrant labor from the Canton region that came in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 
and was put to work building essential infrastructure in Central America. They also include Taiwanese government officials and factory owners who came to Central America as part of Cold War partnerships and then global uh, production chains. Finally, they speak to more recent People's Republic of China, and I'm going to say the word China and PRC interchangeably here to speak to mainland China and the Communist Party, um, have sent state-sponsored agents who have come to forge a new era of trans-Pacific relations through Chinese investment in transport and energy infrastructure, commerce, and investment. These migrants form part of what I call trans-Pacific assemblages um, that are constituted by different types of Chinese actors and Chinese nests in terms of their ethnicity, ideology, age, class, and language, even as they have been universally understood in Central America as a single racialized subject, Chinos. As such, they've been defined as both essential for and a threat to regional development based on racialized stereotypes of their industriousness and intelligence and business acumen, as well as their monopolistic tendencies, insularity and perceived corruption. Um, and this claim, of course, builds on exactly the kind of tropes and visual images that Ana Paulina was just sharing with us um, and that are part of a long and rich history of um, Chinese migration to and across the Americas. Um, that has really highlighted how that migration has been constitutive of the region's borders and national identities, and also of um, very exclusionary immigration regimes. I'm thinking here of um, Brown's own Evelyn Hudahart, Mai Tokaya, uh, and namesake, although not a relation, uh, but also folks like Elliot Young, uh, Freddie Gonzalez, um, uh, Erica Lee, and, and Jason Chang, among um, many others. Um, and I just want to point out that these historians have really highlighted um, how Chinese mobility throughout the Americas was as much a reflection of changing economic opportunities and regional development as it was of xenophobic anti-Chinese violence emanating from the hemispheric orientalisms that I mentioned. Um, and this is a to count, not to counter, but to compliment Anna Paulina's picture, uh, this is the view of that trans-Pacific uh, view of um, the Americas from um, Carlos Lee Wong, this map uh, from the 19th, early 19th to 20th century. Um, he came to reside eventually in Nicaragua after a long history of um, intra-regional migration from the US down into Central America and several different places there. So you can see how his points of reference um, envisioned the Americas from that point. Um, I'm going to switch though because over the last two decades, um, well, I'm missing one slide there. Um, over the last two decades, the rise of a global China and shifting forms of hegemonic Chineseness have impacted the mobility and forms of connection available to Chinese community members in Central America in new ways. In Central America, four of seven countries maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan, while three have switched sides to partner with Beijing. And that includes Costa Rica, who changed diplomatic relations in 2007, Panama um, in 2017, and El Salvador in 2019. When Panama formalized relations with um, Beijing, President Varela um, justified the change in terms of two facts. Um, man, this is just a little too, too responsive, my mouse this morning. Uh, he said, as a country, China represents 20% of the world's population and the second largest economy in the world. In other words, no one could afford not to do business with the PRC. And this calculation reflects China's shift from what many Central Americans considered um, to China to be originally a poor backward country to one that now represents a catalyst um, for its own development. So today I wanna to think about how this changing politics of China and Chineseness in, um, is impacting identity inter-regional networks and mobility in Central America. To do so, I focus on the experience of Chinese community members who participate in the Central American Federation of Chinese Association. This federation was founded in 1966 to bring together Chinese diasporic um, communities across the seven Central American nations through their respective Chinese associations. The federation holds annual conventions of four to five days rotating amongst each Central American nation. Families are invited and the convention offers the opportunity to network with one another, weigh in on um, local and um, regional issues um, and engage in cultural activities. Until recently, Taiwan not only participated in many Chinese community activities, but underwrote many of these events, including um, not only the New Year's celebrations, but the regional convention's annual highlight, the Miss Chinese Central America beauty pageant. Uh, so Taiwan's waning diplomatic presence thus poses new challenges to how Chineseness in Central America gets expressed and where. 
Chinese community members that I worked with in Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Costa Rica generally express great affinity with Taiwan. As Nicaraguan historian Lao Sandino has noted, quote, the majority of Chinese immigrants in Central America have identified with the Taiwanese government because of its democratic and pluralist ideology and have identified with the Taiwanese economy that represents prosperity for the people, unquote. Another older Chinese communist member or community member in Guatemala put it more bluntly, quote, there's no sympathy for the communist government here, unquote. These political considerations sat alongside Chinese community members' fond memories of Taiwan's efforts to help Chinese migrants get residency, even going so far as to work under the table to ensure their citizenship in moments when xenophobic anti-Chinese sentiment reared its head as it did in the 1940s and again in the 1980s. The PRC's more recent entry into the region and its ascendance as official representative of China in three Central American nations has interrupted this history of Chinese cooperation and connection in the region. Chinese community members often critiqued the newly established PRC embassies for their representatives' relationship to its overseas communities. As one Chinese community member complained to me, quote, in Costa Rica, the Chinese ambassador comes only to the biggest events and they don't pay for any of them. Whereas in a place like Honduras, the Taiwanese embassy hosts a New Year's Eve party or New Year's party and everyone is invited. The Chinese embassy in Costa Rica does nothing for the community, unlike the Taiwanese embassy, which is very involved in community politics and community affairs, unquote. Another community member chalked up this distance to the fact that the PRC diplomatic corps lacked understanding of the Chinese diasporic community and experience. According to her, the Beijing diplomats would ask, you're Chinese, why don't you speak Chinese? She went on to complain, they don't get what it means to be an immigrant or to live overseas. More than just benign neglect of the Chinese community, however, the change in diplomatic presence has directly impacted the Chinese association members' ability to connect and move throughout the region. Each year, Chinese association members' ability to connect and move, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, members move um, across the region to attend the Federation's convention. The annual event rotates among different association headquarters across Central America, giving each association the ability um, to sort of highlight its uh, unique features and to familiarize the regional counterparts um, with its own sort of tourist amenities, um, centers and so forth. One effect of the changing diplomatic relations in Costa Rica, Panama and El Salvador, however, was increasing pressure by PRC embassies on their local associations not to attend association events that they associated with Taiwan. Indeed, in some cases, it was reported that the Chinese embassy prohibited its local Chinese association from participating in these Congresses that were to take place in Central American countries that recognize Taiwan. So they would be permitted to attend in years that the um, event would be hosted in a PRC represented country and prohibited in years that it would be in a Taiwanese represented um, uh, country. For example, in 2018, the Guatemalan Chinese Association was slated to host the Federation's convention. When I came to the Salon China in downtown Guatemala City, I could see the extensive last minute renovations being made to the building with workers updating paint, fixing lamps and embellishing decorative features in the main hall. Because the Guatemalan Association had recently opened a museum of Chinese diaspora in the building, I walked through the, through the exhibit with its main organizer as she curated the newest um, updates designed to impress their regional counterparts. However, our conversation about the preparations for the event took a turn when I asked who was coming that year. She confessed that they were unsure whether the Costa Ricans or the Panamanians, who again have PRC represented embassies, uh, would be coming um, because of pressure from their respective embassies. When I followed up a few months later to see how the event had gone and who had attended, she told me that quote unquote unofficial delegations from Costa Rica had come, but no one from Panama could attend. When I talked to those quote unquote unofficial participants back in Costa Rica, because these are small communities, so it's pretty clear who these folks are, they admitted that they had um, kept their travel to Guatemala somewhat discreet in hopes of not raising alarm with their local embassy representatives. These challenges to Chinese community intra-regional mobility were accentuated by shifting logistics around travel to mainland China. While many Chinese community members indulged in trips back to their, their family's native village in Canton, an increasing number of both Chinese and non-Chinese um, Central Americans were soliciting visas to travel to China to explore economic opportunities and establish enterprises through events such as the Canton Fair. 
Indeed, proponents of the new relationship with the PRC often emphasize the new market opportunities and trans-Pacific economic ties as powerful catalysts for Central American region of regional development. And this picture here is a, a snapshot from the um, fifth annual now um, commercial exposition of the PRC in Guatemala, which again, I will remind you, the PRC does not have official diplomatic presence in Guatemala, Taiwan does. So any event that one um, highlights the two national flags together and um, promotes the economic presence of the PRC, but not the political diplomatic presence is still kind of a strange and interesting one. Right? Uh, despite all this interest in traveling to China by Central Americans generally, um, to get a visa, community members had to either travel to a Central American country with a PRC embassy or work through corporate intermediaries. There's lots of services now for which you can do this. Given the number of Guatemalans specifically who sought visas to travel to mainland China, uh, diplomatic personnel from the PRC embassy in Costa Rica would often come to town a few times a year to process these visas. This arrangement, however, had recently landed the Guatemalan Chinese Association in a bind. And this is the Salon China there in Guatemala City. The Taiwanese embassy in, Gu in Guatemala had asked the Chinese Association if it could install a permanent office in this particular installation, um, marking their close relationship. After all, the Taiwanese representatives were present at all the association events generally. Simultaneously, however, the PRC embassy from Costa Rica asked the Guatemalan Association if they could set up shop in the Salon China to do their occasional visa processing work. Wanting to help facilitate um, mobility to China, but feeling themselves caught in a very sticky geopolitical association, uh, the Guatemalan uh, members abdicated any kind of political affinity and rejected both sets of requests. So Costa Rica's relationship with Beijing thus had powerful consequences for Guatemalans' ability to connect to the economic and personal opportunities in China. And even though respective associations tried to stay out of the politics, the dueling Chinas and forms of Chineseness they represented effectively circumscribed Central American Chinese networks and Trans-Pacific mobility. One might expect these ideological differences to divide the Chinese immigrant community, um, but not so. Many of the older Chinese Central Americans eschewed their experience or that their significance, insisting on a strong unified Chinese identity that they described in more essentialist terms. Mm -hmm. um, one, one mentioned to me, for example, I'm Chinese. So Taiwan, China, that difference doesn't matter to me. What matters is my blood. The politics don't matter, unquote. This assertion and others, many, many others like it, of solidarity among Taiwanese and mainland Chinese diasporic communities use the language of common blood and culture as the glue that held them together. In this sense, this older generation of Chinese Central Americans use um, of the term Chinos and peoples referring to them in that sense, um, what did, they didn't object to that. However, uh, a younger generation um, of Chinese Central Americans embraced their Chinese heritage while also articulating a strong sense of Latinidad and national identity grounded in Central America. As a result, many refused to be racialized as Chinos and preferred hyphenated um, identities such as Chinatica, Chinanica, or even just national monikers like Guatemalteca um, that spoke to their roots, their upbringing in Central America, um, their bicultural background and their self-positioning in many cases as intermediaries in trans-Pacific relations. Uh, what you see at this table here were um, participants in the Chinese uh, Central America uh, beauty contest and all of which very deeply identified as um, Chinaticas. As one of them told me um, that they advocated similarly for distinctions among their counterparts as well, not just for their own self identities, but for others in their generation. Um, she says, I have a university colleague who is Taiwanese. They say to him, Oye Chino, ven pa'ca. I tell them he's not Chinese, he's Taiwanese. And that's not because he's bothered by them not calling him Taiwanese, but because that's not his country or his nationality, his identity. Just because we may look at, we are not all Chinos. So let me finish here. Um, my talk today has just really briefly tried to touch upon um, chi how China's changing role in the global development relations has impacted sanctioned forms of mobility networks and even Chinese in, Chineseness in Central America. Um, while Central American nations have historically both recruited and violently expelled Chinese labor for national development, the increasing presence of PRC embassies and agents pose new challenges to the articulation of diasporic Chineseness and its attendant networks and intra-regional mobilities. These diverse forms of China and Chineseness thus shape not only how local residents 
perceived the possibility of a new era of Chinese development in Central America, but how Chinese subjects within the region are able to move, connect, and develop themselves within it. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, um, and your your own alarm meant that I didn't have to have to interrupt. But thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, our final presenter on this panel is Percy Hinson. But before I introduce Percy and his topic, um, let me just say that we have a raise hand feature, and we also have a Q and A feature. Um, if you wish to put your questions into Q and A, I will look for them. I will um, probably rotate between raise hand and Q and A, but please use either, and we will. Uh, you can begin to prepare your questions now, since we're on our final panelists. And um, our final paper is by Percy Hinson, and it's entitled "Coloniality: Development Discourse." Ethnoscapes and HIV in the Caribbean. Percy Hinson is currently professor in the Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies and professor at, at um, Florida International University and professor emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley. He joined FIU in 2011 after spending 32 years at the University of California, Berkeley, where he served in a number of capacities, including director of the Center for African Studies and co-director of the multi-campus research group on Africa that serves all 10 campuses of the University of California. He served as director of African and African Diaspora Studies at FIU between 2016 to 20, and has, uh, sorry, and Percy Hinson received his formal graduate training in comparative political sociology with a particular focus on political economy and in international urbanization and public policy. His research scholarship and scholarly practice is transdisciplinary, more than multidisciplinary, with a substantive focus on the Caribbean African immigrants to the United States. His most recent published works are focused on issues related to regionalism, democracy, development, and the new international order, tourism, and HIV AIDS the latter in the Anglophone Caribbean and Africa. His most recent book titled Reproducing Domination on the Caribbean Postcolonial State is being published University of Mississippi Press in spring 2022. Percy, over to you. Um, hello, um, I'm having problems sharing my screen, which is, which is very, very problematic. Um, let me try again. Kate, can you help with that or somebody from your team with Percy's screen sharing abilities or lack thereof? Or is anybody he from- should, the He yeah. should be able to share his screen. Um, I have made him a co-host. Okay, so I'm let's, not um... sure that there's anything I can do from here. Okay, let, let's, let's see what could happen here. Share screen. If not, I'm going to have to run through my, um, let's try it here. Share screen. Okay. Well, no luck, no luck at all. Okay. Okay. Let, let me, let me just, um, just read it okay. and, um, okay, let's, let, let, let's try again. Share screen. Do you see that green button on the bottom? To share screen. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm. That's what I'm pressing. All right, let's 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 do it without it. Um, it's going to be a little difficult, but um, let's um, let's try. Maybe you can send you know you, you can send your slides to someone in the in the team, and then they can they can. They can no, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll just I'll just um, uh, basically go through um, go through it. 
Have you tried opening the document on your desktop sometimes if it's um, not open on the desktop? Yeah, I've I've done that. I'll I'll, I'll just I'll just go through my um, without the PowerPoint, which is probably going to be fairly difficult. Anyhow, let me do that. Um, the colonial leg legacies of structural stigma, combined with structural vulnerabilities produced by poverty, underdevelopment, government incapacities, and population inflows to explain HIV prevalence in the Caribbean, characterized by overall regional rates that are second only to Africa. High intensities of population inflows driven by tourism and circular forms of migratory patterns by countries' emigrants are critical as sources of foreign exchange, sources of employment generation, and sources of remittance transfers. These inflows continue to have a negative effect on HIV prevalence, even in the face of effective government policies that have reduced colonially derived structural stigma and the structural vulnerabilities of underdevelopment. This pertains even to countries in the region that rank high on the development index of the United Nations development programs. I will use a comparative analysis of selected Caribbean countries to excavate and explain this relationship. Structural stigma related to immoral sexual conduct in the Caribbean is usually justified on religious grounds. This is underscored by references in almost all of the constitutions to a belief in the supremacy of God. Um, its documentary formulation, the transformation of stigma into practice can have far reaching instrument effects. These effects occur partly through the legitimization of punishment against those whose sexuality violate the moral imperatives of heteropatriarchal marital monogamy understood to be the only acceptable and respectable form of sexual conduct um, in many countries in the Caribbean. Legal definitions of marriage are universally specified in state documents as between two persons only of the opposite sex. V violations and precepts of sexual morality are criminalized in laws and statutes. Behaviors considered as gross sexual indecency, such as prostitution, buggery, homosexuality, and marriage between persons of the same sex are singled out as violations of the criminal code in almost all Caribbean countries. Popularly supported on religious grounds, these violations of the law are penalized with imprisonment. The wide acceptance of the moral ideal of a religious or pious life gives these laws their, and their associated practices popular legitimacy. This has a particular implication for precarity with respect to HIV AIDS. Widespread and popular belief that the infection is a punishment from God and that the infected are to blame because, um, uh, be because they did not follow established religious codes, justify punishment and state sanctioned violence against the stigmatized. Now, um, of all the top um, 45 countries in the world with the highest rates of HIV, um, all of them are located in Africa and in the Caribbean, with the exception of Thailand. And this has produced a sense that AIDS is a disease of black people. Now the highest in the Caribbean, um, the Bahamas is number 17 in the world. Haiti um, is number 24 in the world. Belize is number 27 in the world. Jamaica, number 30 in the world. Guyana, number 32 in the world. Suriname, number 35. Barbados, number 36, Trinidad and Tobago, 39, and Dominican Republic, 45. These are the highest rates in the world. Uh, the range in these countries is from 3.30% um, of the adult population, age 15 to 49, in the Bahamas, and 1% in the, the Dominican Republic. Now, these are um, low compared to Africa, but they are very high compared to the rest of the world. France. Um, is ranked seventh highest in the world 
with a prevalence of 0.40, but it has the highest rate in Western Europe. Ukraine um, has the highest rate in Europe, and it is ranked 45th in the world with a rate of 0.9. Cuba, on the other hand, ranks just below France with the 71st highest um, rate in the world and an identical prevalence of 40%. Now, structural stigma acts in combination with structural vulnerabilities to induce precarity, which is understood as a politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social economic networks and become differentially exposed to injury and violence and death. Now, the differences in, in, in um, prevalence um, across countries in the Caribbean uh, result from the following. Um, massive inflows of visitors from overseas related to tourism, uh, low levels of human development, negative influences or external actors and flows, government incapacities and incapabilities, poverty and inequality, ineffective health delivery, delivery infrastructures, um, and the absence or inadequacy of effective interventions for treatment and the prevention of diseases and for knowledge intervention related to their ep epidemiologies. Now, there's a relationship between development and precarity uh, because policies in the Caribbean relate to tourism development, mineral resource extraction, increases in agricultural exports, economic austerity, privatization, and devaluation that result in high dependence on foreign inflows and assistance, including of people, finance, investments, media, technology, and ideas, rural displacement, and high degrees of urbanization, which is a form of migration that persons um, don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to, but it's very, very significant. High levels of poverty and inequality, political instability, high rates of out-migration as a result of all of these things, and high dependence on remittances that produce circular flows of population into the country. Um, transnational flows of people and bi-directional immigration exacerbates risk, risk factors because they, they produce exposure to HIV and its spread. Um, and this results from a tourist industry that is the central driver of development policies in the Caribbean, significant presences of expatriates working as officials for of foreign governments, of multinational agencies, as consultants, as employees of foreign private companies, um, as workers in international organizations, including NGOs, and of those engaged in staffing and management of foreign direct investments, including private businesses, agro-production, finance, commerce, and mining. And this is um, uh, also um, exacerbated by uh, visits by nationals and their families living overseas who emigrated to escape poverty and as responses to the absence of economic uncertainty and to political instability. Now, I have a, I have a figure here um, which uh, just tells you um, the relationship among these things, but, but you can't see it. Um, so what I'm going to do is to quickly go through um, country by country explanations. Bahamas has the highest, highest rates of HIV in the Caribbean, the 17th highest rates in the world, and it has the highest rates of HIV outside Africa. This could be explained by um, um, precarities induced by significant influence of US derived Christian fundamentalism on state policies and practices, high transnational um, inflows of people because of its exclusive dependence on tourism. The tourist industry contributes 50% of the country's GDP, 68% to total export earnings. And in 2014, there were 1.5 million visitors to the country, which has a population of 377,000. Tourism employs over half of the country's labor force, directly or indirectly, producing a high intensity of contact between the population and tourists. The country also has a high level of poverty and the highest um, income wealth inequality in the entire region. This is despite its, its location by UNDP in, among the highest, uh, the countries with highest human development. And it, it has a high uh, per capita GDP of 22,394 US dollars 
compared, for example, with Haiti, which has a per capita GDP of 1,176 US dollars. In Guyana, the rate is um, high, but it is below um, the Bahamas, Jamaica, um, and Haiti. It is 1.6%. Um, it is explained by high structural stigma, which I've explained before, the negative effects of globalization on the capabilities and capacities of governments, um, uh, despite low tourist inflows, poverty and on the development. The country has, has been ranked the second poorest in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti with a GDP per capita of $8,200, which is the 152nd um, in the world, uh, the 134th um, in the world in terms of health expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Its combined per capita expenditure on health is $216 compared with $4,325 for the Bahamas, and its life expectancy is 55 years. There's also circular flow from diasporas living overseas, and there's a ne negative Im impact of mining, which, which parallels Southern African countries with the highest rates of the world. And all of these produce high dependence on transactional sex as responses um, to the crisis produced above. Haiti, at 2.1% has the sec second highest prevalence rates in the region after the Bahamas. Um, it has high structural vulnerabilities. Um, it's ranked the poorest um, country in the Western Hemisphere, and I'm not going to go through the details. Um, it has an ineffective state that lacks a tradition of providing services to the population, massive presence of expatriates, as I described before, constant circular flows of members from the overseas diaspora. But there's also positive effects of, of foreign intervention. The prevalence rates in Haiti has, has declined from 5.6% in 2003 to 2.1% uh, in 2016 because of the effectiveness of external NGOs in ameliorating structural strict stigma through significant influences they exercise over state policies and through their um, ability to deliver treatment and prevention services using successful practices imported from the global industrial north. Now, Jamaica has a much lower prevalence than the Bahamas, despite um, higher structural vulnerabilities in almost every area, including high, high um, tourist presences. This is attributed to um, um, the passage of le le um, legislation prohibiting discrimination against persons infected with HIV, expressions of support for LGBTQ rights by public officials and media sources, um, calls by officials for repealing the country's laws against same-sex marriages, the banning of anti-LGBTQ Christian fundamentalist act activists from the United States attempting to enter into the country, accommodation of organized public expressions um, um, uh, around representations of LGBTQ communities, and supporters of their rights, um, effective public interventions in HIV treatment. Now, all of these are basically produced um, by um, you know, the influence of the, of the Jamaican diaspora and the influence of powerful external actors and retaliations um, against powerful, by powerful um, external actors um, in terms of the tourism industry. Um, these measures have produced a 9% reduction in HIV infection since 2010. Now, Cuba, um, it, you know, has very, very low rates, and it is a clear example of the significant reductions in structural stigma. It has a rate of 0.4% because the country has adopted policies and practices that have resisted and eschewed Western-imposed versions of capitalist development, it has rejected Christian morality and forms of respectability associated with stigma. It has significantly reduced the valorization of the heteronormative family. It has rejected Western notions of rights that typify liberal democracies and persons you know, claim that, that they don't have rights. It has, re um, it has um, um, rejected the right to freedom of movement, the right of uh, persons to migrate internally, the right of freedom of association with foreigners, the right of economic freedom, and the right of freedom of nationals to emigrate, 
and they also have strict controls of persons visiting from overseas, and as well as persons from the Cuban diaspora. Now, tourism is a cautionary tale, um, primarily because massive increase in tourist inflows, example from, for example, from 350,000 in 1996 to 4 million in 2016. This has resulted in a 90% increase Time. in HIV infection rates between 20, 2012 and 2015. Um, so um, just, just let me, I think my time is up, so let me do the conclusion. What becomes evident in all cases discussed are the universal negative effects of structural stigma uh, when notions of sexual immorality become inscribed in government policies. Um, and these have shaped social consciousness throughout the region. Importantly, um, there are different structural vulnerabilities emerging out of the development policies that intensify inflows of tourists into, the country, into these countries. And these combine with economic and social in inequality and poverty and state incapacities. Uh, uh, you know, what is suggested is that policies aimed at reducing infection in the short run will be most successfully, would be more successful if they are organized around the amelioration of structural stigma through targeted policies of governance and economic diversification in ways that reduce dependence on tourism and tourist related employment in the formal and informal sectors. Um, in the medium and long term, what is demanded is a fundamental transformation of developmental policies and practices in ways that significantly reduce structural vulnerabilities and precarity across the entire spectrum of human sustenance. <laughs> okay, that's it. And I'm sorry that I couldn't um, um, show you the slides. <laughs> Thank you very much, Percy. And wow, this panel is uh, really has uh, set us up with a sort of ban here in terms of a, a real smuggish board of, 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 of questions, but there, there's a, there are certainly common strands which hold them together. I'm not going to at all pretend to summarize what has been said across a range of issues related to race, the formation of racial identity, ethnicity, how, how, how identity is, um, is um, affected by international politics, um, sexuality and gender. Um, it's, it's, it's really a huge um, range of questions which non nonetheless underline the critical importance of our thinking about, um, you know, intra-regional movement and its profound effect upon uh, the societies of, of the South and the, the countries of the South. Um, I, do we have any questions on the table? If not, I would like to begin where we ended by asking Percy to very quickly make a quick connection, uh, sort, sort of articulate a little more uh, the relationship between fundamentalist churches and the prevalence of AIDS, because this seems to be a huge um, leap. I, I won't say a leap of faith, but certainly a leap of, 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 of logic, which I would like you to, to, to perhaps elaborate. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, I've discussed it uh, very, very significantly. What has been happening in the Caribbean <coughs> and Latin America and throughout the world has been a massive influence of Christian fundamentalism and Pentecostalism, and it, it, it is receiving um, significant flows of persons, even persons from other Christian denominations and persons from outside um, the Christian domination, um, denomination. And as a result of that, um, what is happening is that in the United States, you know, the most anti, the most homophobic um, and, um, you know, um, anti, um, you know, and, and also heteropatriarchal um, influences on you, you on foreign on policy in the United States happen to be through the Christian fundamentalist movement, and and what they're doing is using their influence to impose these policies on the global South, and they are transferring massive amounts of uh, Pentecostalists throughout the region. 
Now, what is happening as a result of that is that um, the governments in the Caribbean are introducing um, these policies related to heteropatriarchy and you know, uh, abortion and um, all these other things into government legislation. And um, they are creating conditions where the governments are becoming quite reluctant to sort of intervene in terms of HIV AIDS because they see HIV AIDS as a sort of a punishment from God and a deserving punishment from God. And, and this is creating havoc, not only in the Caribbean and in Latin America, but also in Africa as well, you know? And in some African countries, you know, um, um, uh, LGBTQ persons who are declared are given the death penalty. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and what happens is that not only are governments not implementing these policies and practices um, to prevent and, and, and treat HIV, but um, the population itself and healthcare pre- providers are, are not, are, are distancing themselves which is called um, um, personal stigma, they're distancing themselves from treating these populations. And these populations are being very, very reluctant to declare um, their HIV positive status because um, they're going to be stigmatized, um, locked up, et cetera, et cetera. So I I would consider this one of the most important um, fundamental um, conditions of precarity um, in the Caribbean. And of course, Cuba has, has been exempt from that. <laughs> and, and do, do, does, do any of the panelists have questions that they want to throw at each other? I, I certainly have a comment I want to make uh, uh, to Monica, really, and, and that is uh, it, it is fascinating to see um, the sort of, uh, you know, different columns, the pro the pro PRC versus pro Taiwan uh, Chinese uh, relationships in um, in Central America, and um, you know, what I'd like to ask is is a sort of um, backhanded question: To what extent uh, is there a historic division within these Chinese Chinese communities between a sort of uh, more radical uh, pro, if you want, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist trend um, and a sort of mainstream status quo trend that exists prior to the lining up between um, the the nationalists and the communists in in, in mainland China. Is, is, is Is there a political division that precedes this or is it that um, we have like like just uh, an overwhelming um, Taiwanese sentiment that that kind of reflects itself in a conservative tendency amongst the Chinese in Central America? And I'm asking because there are differences in this and in in, in the Caribbean certainly between historically between uh, radical trends in in the small Chinese community and um, um, conservative trends which existed going back into um, the early 20th century. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, and I would actually say that uh, Anna Paulina is probably even better qualified to speak to some of that historical um, roots of those differences than I am. Um, I would just say that I think in some parts um, the distinction breaks itself down into the kinds of or one of the kinds of Chinese migrants that I was talking about, which were those um, original, and even through the 80s, some of the migrants coming originally from the Canton region, um, moving over with the um, consolidation of the um, communist state, right? In 1929 and 49, and then moving also to Tiananmen Square and uh, constituencies that really saw themselves as mainland Chinese, but divorced from communism. Um, and so that may also build on other kinds of deeper seated differences in conservatism <laughs> or, um, or sort of more anti-imperial um, trends, but certainly uh, manifested in a, in a rejection of communist China per se. Um, and it wasn't pro-Taiwan per se, other than the fact that Taiwan was the sort of antidote uh, to that sort of communist trend. 
So um, I would actually, again, defer and open up the conversation. I'm really interested. I was um, fascinated also, Alyssa, by these ideas about, you know, who are permitted travelers and unpermitted travelers. Uh, and so maybe um, Anna Paulina and Alyssa can jump in to think a little bit more about some of the deeper trends of this and also the way it might um, reflect, in this case, uh, permitted travelers who are often indentured labor uh, originally um, and not other kinds of free migrant labor that might have had different kinds of political dispositions. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to add to that both um, with Elisa and to um, Anna and Ma Monica. Um, Elisa, you know, now Guyana is now going to be the, 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 the destination point for every, everything in the Caribbean you know, everyone in the Caribbean. Um, I'm wondering uh, what's gonna happen, uh, whether Guyana is going to sort of adopt those very policies. Basically, you're talking about Trinidad and Barbados, you know, I mean, would that um, undermine um, those tendencies? And, and, and secondly, um, with, with, with Anna and Monica, you know, I mean, um, you know, China is becoming the world's largest center of foreign tourists, and, uh, um, you know, and the relationship with China may very well mitigate um, um, the, 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 the structural stigma, but at the same time, um, the developmental relationships between China and, and, and the region are also intensifying the, 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 the sort of structural factors that, 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 that produce um, HIV. So I'm wondering whether or not you know, relations with China could mitigate these structural factors, even though they sort of intervene in the same way that um, imperialist um, interventions and colonialist interventions have sort of um, explained, um, you know, HIV prevalences and precarities and all, all other areas. Okay, so we literally have, have maybe three minutes. So I'm going to allow Anna Paulina to try to decipher those questions and make a response, and then Alyssa, and then we'll have to um, end it there. But Anna Paulina, you first, and then Alyssa. Sure, thank you. Uh, I think that Monica's um, presentation was really fascinating because it shows the complexities of thinking, the frame of Chinese mainlanders who went to Taiwan, specifically during that period in 1948, 1949, um, and how it's actually, our, our ways of understanding post-colonial and colonial are really complicated by these movements because at in one point they were in many ways war refugees. And then the narrative is usually the, the nationalists were, you know, this colonial settler in Taiwan. But if we look at the stories, there's actually a lot of Taiwanese families who are mainlanders who went, you know, who went to Taiwan and they all have this refugee story. And so from there, many people then went to Latin America. And so Monica's work is just so fascinating how she's analyzing all of these really complex movements, depending on how the country and the movement of the families of people who are going from place to place and how one single person could have been a refugee or colonial settler and, you know, an immigrant, just depending on where they were ending up. So I, I think it just opens up ways to create new frames to think, think about movement and migration. So it's really wonderful work. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, you wanna come in uh, with Percy's Guyana question? Yeah, just sort of stream of consciousness um, response. Thank you. These were really fascinating questions. And Monica, one interesting thing to look at as well in, in Guyana, in February, the new government, there was this mysterious announcement in February, I think of this year, that Taiwan was opening a foreign office in Guyana. Um, and then there was like a huge brouhaha. And then two, two days later, the government had to sort of step back and say, we're committed to a one China policy. This is not happening. This is not actually true. So it probably is interesting to think about what's going on there in terms of seeing how this is also playing out on this northeastern tip of the South American um, uh, um, land mass. But, you know, and, and, and in the case of Diana, uh, Percy, so there's a couple of things. I mean, one, I think both Anna and Monica's presentations have pointed out what it means to think about these migrations in historical perspective and the ways in which they have been shifting. And also when we think about indentureship that often, you know, the question of gender isn't, um, isn't I think, uh, discussed sufficiently in terms of thinking about the ways in which that produce particular kinds of labor flows and the discourses around those labor 
flows, especially when we start to think about questions of reproduction, number one. Number two, in the contemporary period, certainly in Guyana, and I would argue for the rest of the Caribbean, I think it's important as well to think about the distinction that people are making in the Caribbean at a popular level between Chinese investment and Chinese migration streams, right? And certainly in Guyana, you're seeing a lot of tensions erupting, especially in relation to discussions about local content with respect to the emerging oil and gas industry about who is actually coming in to take the jobs and a, a differentiation that is actually resulting in certainly xenophobic language in relation to um, new, um, new migrations into the country, particularly in relation to um, Chinese investment, where the Chinese government, Chinese businesses, and Chinese labor, ordinary people, are sort of being um, held up homogeneously as, as one as a sort of one undifferentiated um, um, you know, space through which we consider these issues. And the last thing I think, you know, the treatment of Haitians in Guyana at the moment, where the attempt um, by the last government to remove the visa um, restrictions and allow Haitians access under freedom of movement. Um, and I should just point out that the last government didn't do that of their own volition. They were actually pushed to that through the activism of folks on the ground, including um, the late activist Sandai. That has been rolled back under the present administration. And certainly you're seeing that huge um, tension with respect to Haitians who are not actually staying in Guyana. They're using it as a, a transit point through to Brazil and then upwards through to the United States, although that's obviously being halted now given the Biden administration's horrific policies of deportation with respect to that. So I think it's going to be really interesting, um, Percy, to think about what's happening. A lot of the discussion on the ground right now in Guyana around local content is that um, there, there are actually very few, if any, jobs in the oil and gas sector, even though there are these huge promises that lots of jobs are coming. What we're seeing is the inflationary effects on house rentals, on food prices, on, on everything. And that is certainly leading to a lot of anxiety about who are all of these foreigners coming in from the Caribbean and beyond to take the very few jobs that Guyanese are actually not getting access to. So it, it's going to make for some really interesting interesting times. I, I just have one little comment. I, I know we're about to end, but Percy, as yes, developing this work, I, I, I would just be interested to, um, to think about the, because you know my presentation was on CARICOM, but to think about the regional approach in relation to the national approaches that you were discussing, because there has been, I think for the last 10 years, the PANCAP, which is the Pan-Caribbean um, partnership uh, in relation to HIV and AIDS, developing a regional policy. So I think thinking about that kind of scale and tension um, is, 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 something useful in relation to the work that you're doing as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. I mean, the games have definitely begun. Uh, this has been a really interesting um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary panel that has opened up questions of ethnicity, of race, as I said before, of international politics, of gender and sexuality, and really, uh, illustrated what the potential of this conference can do in broadening the discussion around movement uh, in the early 21st century. Thank you all very much. Um, I look forward to the panels that are coming and um, uh, a, a little secret, both Anna Pauline and Monica, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do some work on this historic um, Chinese mi migration policy, which is like way um, in, 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 um, out, out of screen for me, but I'm trying and I, I may be in touch with you sometime. Thank you all and take care. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank I'd you. Love to see you all. Yeah. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. <laughs>